Okay, we're going to actually start talking about our main three conic sections. We've already referred to circles a little bit in section one. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about parabolas. And where we are is we are on section 11.2. This is day one. This is page 697. Okay, the first thing that I want to do, let me get the proper shape here. First thing I want to do is I want to talk about what a parabola is. Before I do that, I want to refer to what a conic section is. And when we talk about conic sections, you learned about this in Algebra 2, but I want to run through it again with you. A conic section is a slicing of a conic. A conic is this double cone here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a plane and we're going to slice this conic different ways. And so one of the ways we can do it is if we slice straight across perpendicular to the vertical axis, we get our circle. We talked about that in the first section. Now what we're going to do is we're going to slice it at a bit of an angle here. And we're going to see that when we come in with a plane and we slice one of the cones of this double cone, this conic, at a particular angle, we slice off a piece of it like this, and as soon as it turns to face us, we're going to see in purple that we have a cross section. And that cross section is where our parabola comes from. So when we talk about conic sections, this is what we're referring to. And we'll see something similar when we deal with ellipses and hyperbolas as well. So that's our conic section idea. As far as the definition of a parabola, a parabola is the locus of points. And what locus means is basically collection. That's the idea. It's the collection of points in a plane um, that are equidistant from a line and a point not on that line. So we have a line. We have a point that is not on that line. And what we're going to do is we're going to find all the points that are the same distance away from the point as they are from the line. So for example, we have a point right here where this distance is the same as this distance. We have a point over here somewhere where this is the same as this. We're talking about the perpendicular distance of the line, the shortest distance always. Over here, we have one maybe in here somewhere where that distance is the same as that. And then maybe we get one up here somewhere where that is the same as that. And maybe we have one up here where that is congruent to that. And if we piece all of these points together, there's an infinite number of them what we get is our parabola. The point has a particular name. The point is called the focus. I'll label that F. The line is called the directrix. And I'll label that DIR. This is actually an infinite line. This point here is our vertex. And so we get our parabola. So what I'd like to do is show you one of these actually being constructed so that you have a, a slightly better um, idea of the picture. Mine's a little bit lopsided here. So what I've done is I've actually, through Geometer Sketchpad, created a construction. This is like a, a compass and straight edge construction from geometry, although we can't see all the construction right now that's going on. But what I've done is I've constructed a focus and a directrix. This point D represents any point where this distance from D to F is congruent or is equal to this distance from D to the line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this control point along the line, and that's going to change these two distances. But you'll see that these two distances always remain the same. And by dragging this thing around, what you're going to see is we get all the different points represented by those dots 
where those two distances are congruent. And so what we end up with, when we drag this thing all over the place, is we end up with a nice parabola. So this is what I was trying to show you on that other diagram. This is a lot nicer, though, to look at. How do we change the shape of the parabola? There are a couple different ways. But basically, they all involve moving the focus relative to the directrix. And so if I move the focus farther away from the directrix, I get a wider parabola. If I, however, move the focus closer to the directrix, I get a steeper parabola. But nonetheless, I do get a perfect parabola. So that's the idea behind this. OK. So that's the idea of our parabola. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the equations and how we work with those equations. Again, you did this when you did conic sections in Algebra 2, so I'm going to go through this somewhat on the, on the brief side. For parabolas, everything is done relative to its vertex. And so our vertex is going to be at some generic point h comma k. There are two different types of parabolas. You have parabolas that open this way or this way, so up or down. That's in the y direction, right? Because y goes up and down vertically. So these are what I call the y direction parabolas. We also have parabolas that go this way. They open either right, I'm sorry, left or right. Those are what I refer to as the x direction parabolas because they're opening in the x direction horizontally. For the y direction parabolas, your basic equation is x minus h squared equals 4py minus k, where again, h comma k are the coordinates of the vertex. For these, you get y minus k being squared is equal to 4p times x minus h. And we'll talk about the p in just a moment. So again, the vertex is at h comma k. Notice that k comes first, but you still have to find the h, the x-coordinate, to represent the x-coordinate. And then the k represents the y-coordinate. You can't get the x-coordinate from the y parentheses. Likewise, you can't get the y-coordinate from the x parentheses. So pay attention to that. When that's reversed on you, don't fall into that trap. Make sure you go to the x first in order to get that coordinate, then come back to the y. OK. So. Let's talk about what P represents. What P represents, going back to our picture, is P is the distance from the vertex to the focus. That's what we consider P. It's a distance. Now, the distance from the vertex to the directrix is also the same distance P, but I'm going to refer to it as negative P, kind of in quotes. Its distance is still p, but we're going in the opposite direction, hence the negative p that I'm referring to. So if the focus requires us to go up 7 units, then the directrix requires us to go down 7 units. Also notice that the directrix runs horizontal relative to this parabola. In this particular section, your directrix is always going to be either vertical or horizontal. It's not going to be diagonal. And which one it is is very easy to determine from the direction that the parabola opens because the directrix has to be such that it does not crash into the parabola. Okay? If your directrix is going to crash into the parabola, then it's not correct. You have to make it go the other direction. So if I made this vertical, no matter where I put it, eventually, since that parabola gets wider and wider, and since the line would go forever, it would eventually crash into it. So it must be horizontal on this one. Likewise, on these, the directrix has to be vertical so it doesn't crash into the parabola. OK, so let's take a look at a particular example. Let's take a look at x minus 1 squared equals 8 times y plus 2. 
Notice this matches this, so it's going to be either an up or a down. Now, the way you can tell which kind it's going to be is by looking at the variable, either x or y, that is on the side with the 4p. Now, notice, obviously, we don't see a p in this equation anymore, but our 4p is this 8 right here. Because notice, here is our x minus h squared. Notice, this is our y minus k. So that means that 4p is equal to 8. OK. Sorry, PA announcement in the background there. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to first identify our vertex. And our vertex is going to be h comma k. We go to the x parentheses. And notice that there's a negative built into the formula in front of both the h and the k. That means that h and k are the opposite of what they appear to be. If x minus h is x minus 1, then clearly the h is just positive 1 not negative 1. It's the opposite of what it appears to be. Likewise, if y minus k is y plus 2, then clearly k must be negative 2. y minus negative 2 becomes y plus 2. So h and k are the opposite of what they appear to be. So we identify our vertex. The next thing that we want to identify is we want to identify our 4p, which we've already talked about. Notice that the x minus h squared is accounted for. Notice that the y minus k is accounted for. The only thing I haven't accounted for so far is the 4p. And the only thing I haven't accounted for here is the 8. Therefore, let me clean that up a little bit, 4p is equal to 8. Now, obviously, you can look at that and just say, oh, look, p must be 2. I don't want you to do that. Write down 4p equals 8. You'll see why in just a few minutes here. We'll come back to that 4p number as well. But yes, clearly p is equal to positive 2. Now, we know it's opening either up or down. The way you tell specifically which way it opens is by looking at p. If you have a positive value of p, it's going to open upward. If you have a negative value of p, it's going to open downward. Likewise, on the horizontal ones, a positive p opens in the positive x direction to the right. Negative p opens in the negative x direction to the left. So this one is going to open upward. I'm actually going to grab this information. I'm just going to move it so I can bring my graph grid in in just a moment. Let me put it down there. All right. What I'm now going to do is I'm now going to get a graph grid because we want to graph this thing. So we found our vertex. We found our p, which remembers the distance from the vertex to the focus. So my vertex is at 1, negative 2 right there. Now notice we said this thing is going to open up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to very lightly kind of sketch in a temporary placeholder for my parabola. I highly recommend that you do this. Okay, Sketching the graph is the key to organizing your information and helping you see what you need to see. On a conic section, not just parabolas, but all of our conic sections, they always curve around their foci which means that the focus for this has to be up inside the parabola, which means I need to go up to get from the vertex to the focus. How far, excuse me, how far up? Two units. Because p is the distance from the vertex to the focus. So we have to go up two units in this case. If we were opening this way, we'd go to the right two units. If we were opening this way, we'd go to the left two units. How would we know that? Because p would be negative 2. OK, so from here, I have to go up one, two units. That's my focus. Right away, since they're going to ask us for this, I'm going to put that my focus has the coordinates 1, 0. I can read that straight off my graph. Now, if I'm going up two units to get to my focus, then I have to go down two units to get to my directrix. So I go down 1, 2 units. The problem is that point, 1, comma, negative 4, is not my directrix. Because remember, the directrix is a line, not a point. It can't be a vertical line, because that would hit the parabola. So it must be a horizontal line. So therefore, this is our directrix. And just by looking at that, it cuts across the y-axis at negative 4. So our directrix 
has the equation y equals negative 4. Your directrix is either always y equals for horizontal or x equals a number for vertical. Okay, now, the focus of the directrix aren't required on the graph, but you want to kind of sketch them in lightly just so you know where they go to make sure your picture is looking right. Now what we have to do is we have to figure out what the actual parabola looks like because I don't know how wide this is supposed to be. I just sketched in a parabola that opens up that goes through the correct vertex. Now there are two ways you can graph these. One is you can go back to the original equation and you can make a t-chart. That will always work. Remember, t-charts always work, table of values. I'm not going to do it that way though. It turns out that there's something very nice on the conic version of parabolas. I guess it's on any parabola, but we use it in the conic version. And that is that there's a particular width of this parabola when measured through the focus. Just wanted to get that to look a little bit better. This is the width of the parabola when measured through the focus. We have a name for that. We call the length of this the focal width. And it turns out that the focal width is very easy to find. It turns out to be the absolute value of 4p. That's why I asked you to write down that 4p number, because we need it to graph the parabola. The absolute value comes in because 4p is a width. It's a distance. We need it to be positive, not negative. So what that's saying is we just care about the number part of it. So if we go back here, it turns out that our focal width is equal to the absolute value of 4p, which is 8. And so the absolute value of 8 is 8. So that tells us that from the left side of this parabola to the right side, when measured through the focus, is a distance of 8. Well, if this is going to go a total of 8 units across, then it should make sense to you that from the focus to one side of the parabola and from the focus to the other side of the parabola must be 4 units each for a total of 8. So from the focus, I go to the right, 1, 2, 3, 4. From the focus, I go to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4. And now this, connecting to my vertex, is my actual parabola. And so there's no need now for this old temporary one. And there's no need for a table of values. There's our parabola. The only thing typically left for us to find is the axis of symmetry, which you guys have dealt with before the axis of symmetry is the vertical line in this case that runs straight up through both the focus and the vertex that's going to be x is equal to 1 since it's a vertical line if this was a sideways parabola it would be y is equal to something like 7 there we go there's graphing parabolas using the conic form of the equation this is what is typically referred to as standard form in this chapter. I'm going to refer to it as standard conic form. Because we already have another equation that's called standic, sta, excuse me, standard form of a parabola. That's y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. This is standard conic form in that it uses p. So it's referencing the focus directly. OK, let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at something that looks like this. And you've done these before as well in Algebra 2. 2y squared minus 4y minus x plus 5 is equal to 0. The problem with this one is that it's not in the proper form. This is not in that x minus h squared equals 4py minus k or the horizontal form either. It is a parabola. We can tell it's a parabola because only one of our two variables is being squared. We have a y squared, but no x squared. So therefore, it must be a parabola. It cannot be any of our other conic sections. They all have an x squared and a y squared. That's going to become very important later on in the chapter. So this is a y squared parabola. So what we're going to do is we're going to isolate the y's on one side. And we're going to move this stuff to the other side the non-y terms. Sorry, that's supposed to be a plus x and a minus 5. So those cancel. 
Notice I'm leaving some space in here. Now what we're going to do is we've got to get this into that y minus k quantity squared form. In order to take a polynomial, a quadratic polynomial, and make it into a perfect square, we have to complete the square. You learned this in Algebra 1. You learned it again last year in Algebra 2. We've talked about it a little bit this year, completing the square. In order to complete the square, this number right here has to be a 1. Positive 1. If it's not, we need to make it a 1. And the way that I would suggest you make it a 1 is factor it out of the two y terms. Whether it goes into the second one or not doesn't matter. We're going to divide a 2 out. So I put the 2 on the outside, and I get y squared minus 2y equals x minus 5. Notice I left some space in here because we're going to complete the square on the stuff inside the parentheses. Now, going back to Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, the way you complete the square once it's 1x squared or 1y squared, you take half of the linear term coefficient, the x or the y term, without the squared. So in this case, we're going to take half of negative 2. And when we take half of negative 2, that gives us negative 1. We're then going to take negative 1. Sorry, I actually meant for that to still be in black. I apologize. We then take that negative 1 and we square it, which gives us positive 1. That one I want in red. And we add that to both sides. Mr. Walker, could you please call the front office at 7700? Mr. Walker, please call the front office at 7700. Sorry, folks, too many announcements on the PA today in the background. We're going to add one to both sides. There's only one problem. By adding one here and adding one there, I now just lost my equal sign. Why did I lose my equal sign? Because by putting a plus 1 in here, I did not make the left side bigger by 1. I made the left side bigger by 2. Because this 2 will attach itself to that 1 if we were to distribute. Therefore, that plus 1 really makes for a plus 2. So what I have to do is I really have to put a plus 2 here, and then I get my equal sign back. So it's very important if you factored anything else out, at the beginning, you need to redistribute that, at least in your head, to see what number you actually added to that side so that you can add it to the other side. All right. Now what we're going to do is we are going to um, take this and we're going to factor it. So this becomes 2 times, and this becomes y minus 1 quantity squared. It factors into a perfect square. We created it that way. We don't have to do any extra work because we know it's going to factor into y minus 1 because when we took half of negative 2, we got a negative 1. So it's going to be the variable followed by whatever this is with the proper plus or minus guarantee. We created it that way. On this side, we get x minus 3. Now, we're almost there. We are looking for y minus k squared equals 4p x minus h. We have our y minus k squared, but we have this number in the front. And we have something that looks like x, x minus h. We're not sure about the 4p thing, but we have to get rid of this too. You can divide by 2, but what's better is we're really going to do it this way. We're going to multiply both sides by 1 half. And the reason I'm going to do that is those cancel out, leaving me my y minus 1 squared, that's my y minus k squared, equals 1 half times x minus 3. Notice I didn't distribute the 1 half. Why not? Because this is now the right form here. So therefore, we now have the equation that we're going to graph. So take a look at that for just a moment. I'm going to move this to another screen, and then we'll actually draw this thing. All right. So 
So here is our equation. Notice that x is on the side with the 4p, which means it's going to open in the x direction. So it's either going to be one of these or it's going to be one of these. Our vertex is h comma k. Remember, h comes from the x. We're getting the x coordinate, so we have to go to the x parentheses. Opposite of what it looks like is positive 3. k comes from the y parentheses. Opposite of what it looks like is positive 1, so there's our vertex. Notice that our 4p is equal to 1 half, which makes p equal to 1 over 8. Since p is positive, we know we're going to open in this direction. So it's going to open to the right. Because we're opening in the x direction, and p is positive. Now, I'm going to get a blank graph grid to graph this on. You'll see why in just a moment. My problem is here, guys, that p is 1 over 8. And if I want to graph this thing with a 1 over 8, that's pretty small if that's a 1 unit mark right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make, let's say, this 1 and this 2, which makes this 1 fourth, excuse me, 1 fourth. Um, yeah, that's fine. 1, 2, 3, 4, that'll be 3. So our vertex is at 3 comma 1. I'll put one right there. So 3 comma 1 is right there. We know this is going to open to the right. So it's going to go like that. So therefore, we know our focus has to be out here somewhere because it has to be on the inside of the parabola. P is 1 eighth. So since 1 unit is 1 fourth, I'm going to have to go half of one mark. And so from here to here is going to be 1 eighth. So that's going to be my focus, which is at 3 plus an eighth. So the focus is going to be at 3 and 1 eighth comma 1. Our directrix, instead of moving to the right an eighth, has to go to the left an eighth. And it's going to have to be vertical so that it doesn't crash into the parabola. So that's going to be an x equals, because it's vertical, and that's at 2 and 2, 4, 6, 7 eighths, or 3 minus an eighth. So x equals 2 and 7 eighths. Or what I would really do, guys, is write x equals 16 plus 7 is 23 over 8. We don't typically like to use mixed numbers in equations. But for this particular part, either one will do. Now the last thing we have to do is find the focal width. The focal width, remember, is equal to the absolute value of 4p, which is a half. And so if we are going to go have a width of a half, that means we have to go half of that or a quarter each way. A quarter is one mark one of our hash marks. So from the focus, I'm going to go up one mark. And from the focus, I'm going to go down one mark. And so I wasn't too far off. This is what our actual problem is going to look like. And there we go. And there's our focus. The axis of symmetry, by the way, if we were asked for that, it's going to be y equals because it's horizontal, and it's going right here through y equals 1. So hopefully this refreshes your memory on some of the issues with graphing parabolas from last year in Algebra 2. So I suggest that you take a look at the homework assignment or the classwork assignment for tomorrow. Maybe you can get a couple of the quick, easy ones out of the way, and we can spend some time in class working on some of the more difficult ones.